Hello everyone. My name is Monica and I will be walking you through doing field necropsies on calves. First, we need to talk about personal safety equipment. As you can see, I am wearing coveralls to protect myself and my clothing from being contaminated with disease carrying tissues or fluids. I also recommend safety glasses or goggles to protect your eyes from backsplash. Masks may also be warm, but I do not have any of these to show you today. Gloves are also an important part to protection. Rubber or latex gloves are preferred due to their low cost, wide availability, and because they are disposable and do not need to be disinfected. As the force needed to cut through some tissues during the necropsy may be the same or greater than the force needed to cut through your own hand, using a cut resistant glove is also recommended. Wear the glove on your non-dominant hand to prevent serious lacerations. The knife you use is not, is not important as long as it is comfortable to you and easy to sharpen. Dull knives, as a general rule, are much more dangerous than sharp ones as they require more force and are less predictable. If you plan on doing a lot of necropsies, I suggest that you invest in a good quality sharpener. For more delicate tissues and structures, it may be useful to have a pair of scissors and a set of thumb forceps. I prefer to use my rat tooth forceps, but any can be used. I also suggest rib cutters or shears to open up the thorax. This is a striker saw. It is a rapidly oscillating saw used for cutting bone or plaster casts. Though it cuts hard substances efficiently, soft tissues give and are not normally injured. This makes it a relatively safe saw to use for cutting open the skull. Baling twine is easy to find on the farm. I use it to tie the animal back together for easy disposal. And the last items on our list are disinfectant products. It doesn't matter if you use wipes or sprays as long as it is effective against pathogens the animal carries. Begin with the animal on its left side. In an adult animal, this places the rumen on the downside. Inspect the animal for any obvious signs of trauma or for any other abnormality, such as bleeding from the nose, rectum, or vulva. For calves, check the umbilicus for masses or hernias. For bulls, examine the external genitalia. Make the first incision under the animal's lower jaw. Slide the knife under the skin and make a smooth cut along the neck. Continue the skin incision along the body between the front limbs and above the outer or external genitalia if present. Free the skin from the right side of the body wall from the incision to dorsal at the level of the spine. This will allow for reflection of the limbs without cutting through any more of the hide. Don't make too many holes in the skin as the hide is the only portion of the animal that can be salvaged by a rendering service. Intact hide also makes it easier to close and remove the carcass after the necropsy is performed. Reflect the forelimb by cutting between the muscles of the shoulder and those of the body wall. As you lift up on the forelimb, you will see thin, clear to white connective tissue. Cut this while pulling the limb dorsally.
Lift the hind limb up and cut through the muscle bellies towards the hip joint, which consists of the head of the femur and the acetabulum. When you reach the joint, it will look like a ball and socket. Cut through the ligament connecting these two parts to allow the joint to come apart and reflect the limb dorsally. Carefully make an incision in the abdomen just behind the ribs. Try not to cut too deep in order to avoid penetrating the underlying organs. It may be helpful to cut through each abdominal muscle individually, starting with the external abdominal oblique, followed by the internal abdominal oblique, the transversus abdominis, and finally the rectus abdominis. Cut the abdominal wall along the rib, first ventrally, then dorsally. Continue the cut from the dorsal edge of the ribs towards the pubis. There should now be an abdominal flap. When folded ventrally, it exposes the abdominal contents. Later, it will serve to keep the organs contained within the carcass during removal of the animal. Examine the color, position, and size of the organs. If there is fluid in the abdominal cavity, note the approximate amount and color of it. You are now looking at the diaphragm. It lies under the last rib and separates the abdominal and thoracic cavities. Puncture the diaphragm while listening for air to rush into the thoracic cavity. Normally, the thoracic cavity is under negative pressure to keep the lungs inflated. This should still be the case after death, unless there has been trauma to the chest. Cut the entire right side of the diaphragm away from the rib cage. This allows for the first look into the thoracic cavity. Cut the muscles covering the rib cage along the dorsal edge where the ribs meet the spine. Using rib cutters, Cut the ribs along the incision that was just made in the muscle. There should be 13. Lift up on the rib cage while cutting any tissue attaching the ribs at the incision site. Once the dorsal portion of the rib cage is freed, reflect it ventrally. Push down on the ribs to fracture them at the junction between bone and cartilage. This will create a tray that can be used as a cutting platform during the remainder of the necropsy. Now that both the abdominal and thoracic cavities are exposed, any samples needed for bacterial viral or fungal culture should be taken to decrease the amount of contamination of the sample. 
Let's focus on the esophagus and trachea. Begin by cutting between the lower jawbone or mandible on either side of the tongue. Reach in and pull out the tongue. Cut the soft tissue on both sides of the tongue while you pull on it. You will notice small bones, called hyoid bones, on either side of the tongue. These help to suspend both the tongue and the larynx. These need to be disarticulated or cut to completely take out the tongue with the esophagus and trachea. Here is a better view of the hyoid bones. Here are the arytenoid cartilage, epiglottis, and the opening I just traced is the glottis. Cut along the dorsal edge of the larynx to open it and look for lesions. Continue this cut down the trachea to the bifurcation of the lungs and examine this also for lesions. Lesions may include necrosis and ulcers. Feed or other foreign material may be present. If the surrounding tissue looks red or inflamed, it is likely that the material was there prior to death. Cut the esophagus from the larynx to the point of the lungs. Examine the inner lining for any lesions such as bruising, hemorrhage, or ulcers. You may also find esophageal worms. They look like squiggly lines on the inner surface of the esophagus. These are incidental findings and are of no concern. We will now examine the heart and lungs. To orient you, this is the diaphragm, which we already discussed 
separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. We will examine the thin sac surrounding the heart called the pericardium first. Cut it open and make note of adhesions and fluids. Normally the pericardium is not adhered to the heart and there is a small amount of fluid within it. Make note of any large amounts of clear fluid, blood, or pus in the pericardium. The lungs should appear a bright pink color and be spongy to the touch. Examine the general appearance of the right lung. Note if there are any areas that are darker than others or if there are any adhesions or lesions on the lung. Reflect the right lung cranially towards the head, cutting away any connective tissue. Cut the lung near the base of the heart at its hilus. The bronchus is rigid and is between the pulmonary artery and vein. Use scissors and forceps to cut open the bronchus, artery, and vein. There may be food and or foam in the airways. This usually occurs during the last terminal breath. However, still make note of the amount and color of the substance. Make lengthwise cuts in the lung to observe the deep tissue. Make notes if you see excessive amounts of blood in the right lung or if it seems to pop when you squeeze it. Cut out the heart to examine later. The left lung can be examined similarly. Keep in mind this lung may look darker because blood may pool there after death.
So to begin the heart, I want to get oriented by going over some of the external structures. This entire area is the left side of the heart. And this is the right side. This is the right auricle, which is an extension of the right atrium. And this is the left auricle. The structure I have in my left hand, that is the pulmonary trunk, which sends deoxygenated blood to the lungs. This is a cranial vena cava. And here is the caudal vena cava, both of which bring blood from the body back to the heart. And this is the aorta, which brings oxygenated blood to the body. Now that we are oriented, I'll use scissors to cut both vena cavas and continue the cut along the septum to the apex of the heart. Now, reverse the scissors to cut towards and through the pulmonary trunk. There should now be a V cut into the right side of the heart. Examine the valves and the inside of the heart. Note any lesions such as thickening of the muscle wall, holes, abscesses, or growth on the muscles or valves. Valves should be smooth, shiny, and white. Because this valve is near the pulmonary trunk, it is called the pulmonary valve. These are papillary muscles and they attach to these string-like fibers called chordae tendinae. Both of these help with the function of the tricuspid valve which is located between the right atrium and right ventricle. Flip the heart to reveal the left side. Make a cut with your scissors from the apex to the base.
you will notice the ventricle wall is two to three times thicker than the right. Examine the valves just as you did on the right side of the heart. This is the mitral valve. It is located between the left atrium and left ventricle. The muscles you see branching in the atria are the pectinate muscles. Now I will make a cut through both ventricles. Is it, it is easy to appreciate the difference in wall thickness now. The left here is much thicker than the right here. Now let's examine the kidney and urinary bladder. The right kidney will lie in a fat layer close to the spine and caudal to the liver. Pull the fat away to expose the kidney. Cut the kidney lengthwise to examine the inner tissue. Pull back the capsule to examine the outer surface of the kidney. Note if the kidney is a pale yellow color or has white spots on its surface. Look for infarctions, which are pale indented areas caused by a decrease of blood and oxygen to the tissue. Also, if the kidney is small and scarred, this is indicative of chronic kidney disease. The left kidney is found by cutting the omentum away from the body wall 
and by reflecting the entire intestinal tract dorsally over the spine of the animal. The area where the intestines meet above the rumen is another fatty area covered, covering the kidney. Examine this left kidney in the same manner as the right kidney. Caudal to the kidneys is the urinary bladder. If the urinary bladder is full, take a sample with a clean needle and syringe. Cut open the bladder to examine the inner surface. Note that the walls of the urinary bladder are elastic, which allows filling and releasing of urine. Now we will examine the reproductive tract. I have included both a male and female tract for completeness. This is the male tract. We will start here at the prepuce and follow it back to the glans penis. The glans penis is attached to the sheath at birth and will not detach fully until sexual maturity. The calf penis is slender and contains little erectile tissue. The characteristic sigmoid flexure does not occur until the animal is greater than three months of age. This calf is less than one week old. The testes should lie in a pendulous scrotum and are attached to the spermatic cord, which enters the abdominal cavity through the vaginal ring. Not pictured are the accessory sex glands. All four are present in cattle and include the ampulla, the bulbo urethral gland, the prostate, and the vesicular gland. Now we will look at the normal female tract. This thick portion is the uterine body, and these are the uterine horns. From here, the whole tract is paired. This tiny winding tube is the salpinx, also known as the uterine tube or the fallopian tube. And here, at the tip of my finger, is the ovary. Now, we will examine the spleen. The spleen is found on the left side of the body, under the digestive tract. Note any obvious enlargement or splenic masses. Make several incisions in the spleen to examine the inner tissue. It may be dark due to congestion of blood.
The liver is the next organ to be examined. The liver is the large organ between the foregut and the diaphragm. It should have sharp edges and a smooth surface. Note if there are any lesions on the surface along with the color and size of the liver. Enlarged livers will have rounded edges. Cut into the liver to view deeper tissue. The gallbladder is located within the liver lobes. It is green in color and can be as large as a grapefruit in an adult. Its contents are excreted into the duodenum. Cut open the gallbladder and ducts to look for abnormalities. Flukes and blockages may be found. We will next examine the four compartments of the fore stomach. We will begin with the abomasum. We will use the greater omentum and lesser omentum as landmarks to find the abomasum. Both are made up of a membranous layer of fatty tissue that covers and supports the organs of the lower abdominal area. Make a lengthwise cut through the abomasum and examine the inner surface. The abomasum is considered to be the true stomach as it secretes gastric acids for the breakdown of food. For this reason, it has a smooth surface and usually liquid contents. If the calf is still suckling, you may find curdled milk. Here is a close-up of the rugae. The folds of the rugae increase surface area. The next compartment is the omasum. In the adult ruminant, this organ should feel firm and contain leaves like a book. These are used to grind up food particles from the rumen. Here in this close-up, you can see that the leaves are not fully developed. Now we will move to the reticulum. The reticulum is the cranial most portion of the forestomach. Its main function is to send small and more dense digestive particles to the omasum while allowing larger particles to remain in the rumen.
This close-up shows the characteristic honeycomb appearance. The final compartment is the rumen. Though unimpressive in the pre-ruminant calf, it is the largest compartment in an adult ruminant. When fully developed, the inner surface looks a lot like shag carpet made of thousands of papillae that aid in the absorption of fatty acids. The intestines should now be examined. Multiple segments for multiple areas of intestine should be examined for inner color and appearance. All should have a smooth, shiny appearance. This section here is the duodenum. This section of the intestine is the jejunum. You can distinguish it from the duodenum by the presence of the arterial arcades, which are quite prominent. The spiral colon can be found by flipping the intestines dorsally over the spine. Be sure to cut open multiple areas of the spiral colon to view inner tissue. This last section of intestine is the descending colon. Examine the wall along with the contents. Now we will remove the head and open the skull. Extend the head and cut the muscles of the neck directly behind the jaw. You should come to where the first vertebrae, the atlas, attaches to the skull. This joint is the atlanto-occipital joint. Cut away all attachments and transect the spinal cord. Cut the hide and muscles dorsal to the spine to free the head from the body.
I will be using a striker saw to enter the skull, so the first step will be to remove all of the soft tissue. Some of the tissues being removed are the skin and temporalis muscles. Examination of the brain is not often done unless neurologic disease is suspected. Some common neurologic diseases in calves are polioencephalomalacia, lead poisoning, cerebellar hypoplasia caused by bovine viral diarrhea virus, and trauma. Polioencephalomalacia is characterized by softening of the gray matter of the brain. The cause can be unclear and will need to be investigated. One common cause is dietary thiamine deficiency. It is also suggested that a high or normal salt intake coupled with dehydration, which is possible for calves fed an improperly mixed milk replacer, can also cause polioencephalomalacia. Prior to death, these animals may exhibit neurologic signs such as blindness, opisthotonus, and head pressing. Lead poisoning is one of the most common causes of acute encephalopathy in calves. Determining the source of the poisoning may present a problem, but once found, it is not difficult to reach a tentative diagnosis. The disease course can be as short as 12 to 24 hours, with the animal being found dead before signs can be observed. Typical clinical signs can include convulsions, blindness, excitement, and muscle tremors. Lead levels can be detected in the blood, liver, or kidney cortex. Gross abnormalities of the brain can include edema, congestion of the cerebral cortex, or flattening of the gyri. Cerebellar hypoplasia is a common congenital abnormality associated with infection by a bovine viral diarrhea virus. Signs in a newborn calf may include ataxia, tremors, wide stance, stumbling, and failure to nurse. Cerebellar hypoplasia can be determined by weighing the cerebellum and determining its percentage in comparison to total brain weight. Trauma is a broad category that can include both external trauma, such as collision, and internal trauma, such as compression due to neoplasm. External trauma is more common. It can include, but is not limited to, accidental kicking or crushing done by the mother and injury during a tough calving. Luckily, the brain is protected by sinuses, compact bone, meninges, and CSF to decrease the occurrence of external trauma doing significant damage. Now that the soft tissue is removed, I will make a cut on both sides of the skull from the occipital condyle across the parietal bone and through a portion of the frontal bone. I will connect these lines by making one more cut across the frontal bone, just caudal to the eyes.
pry open the skull to expose the brain. Gently lift the brain out of the skull. The softness of this brain is an artifact of freezing and then thawing. Most lesions of the brain are not grossly apparent. To examine the brain further, take any of the fresh tissue samples needed, then place the rest of the brain in formaldehyde. Formaldehyde fixes the tissue and makes it easier to examine later with histology. Now we need to ready the body for disposal. Place all organs in the carcass and pull the hide over the body. Cut small holes in the hide within 4 inches of the edge to decrease the amount of damage done to the hide. Tie the hide together with baling twine. Now that the body is ready for disposal, be sure to properly clean the area where the necropsy was performed. Wash your hands, boots, and coveralls before handling other animals. Now I want to have some fun and discuss the case of Abnormal Abby. Well, actually, Abby the calf. Abby was an unusual case for me at the beginning. I first noticed her underdeveloped reproductive system, but these two tubular structures kept my attention. I instantly assumed she was a free martin, which is a female calf born to a male twin, so I hit the books in an effort to find out. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the term free martin, it is given to female calves that develop reproductive abnormalities in the womb while sharing it with a male sibling. During fetal development, the male gonad begins to differentiate at an earlier stage than the female and becomes stereogenically active. The shared fetal blood supply also allows for the transfer of germinal stem cells from the male to the female twin embryo. Anti-malarian hormone and testosterone from the male gonads and the relocated germinal stem cells inhibit the female reproductive tract development. Varying degrees of masculinization have been described. So, when I did my research, I suspected 
that those tubular organs were in fact spermatic cords. In research articles, spermatic cords were described to dive and go caudal and enter at the opening of the vestibule or vagina. I decided to use the striker saw to cut open the pelvis so I could more easily dissect out the path of the tubes. So here are the tubes post dissection. Though they did initially dive and go caudal, their path was soon reversed to cranial. As you can see, the tube seems to attach to the caudal most portion of the aorta. On this other side, I decided to cut into the tube just to find that it was indeed continuous with the aorta. Now I was puzzled. So I continued searching for the answer. After striking out on numerous searches, I finally stumbled across an image showing fetal blood flow. Then it all clicked. So to explain, this is an image showing the original position of the tubular structure. Notice the proximity of the structures, denoted with blue arrows, to the bladder, denoted by orange. Now look at the structure the green arrow is pointing to. The green arrow is pointing to the urachus, a fetal structure that connects with the umbilical cord and allows for the release of urine into the placenta during development. Within a few days of birth, the urachus and its artery and vein will shrink. So, if the urachus is present, I conclude that the two tubular structures are remnants of the umbilical artery. It is normal for the arteries to retract into the abdomen at birth and shrink down in the following days. Since I had limited history on this calf prior to necropsy, the presence of the artery serves to help me predict the age of the calf. So other than the underdeveloped reproductive tract, it turns out that abnormal abdi was not that abnormal at all. Now we will move on to the case of premature petunia. Petunia is a calf that was aborted six to seven months into gestation by my estimation. I staged this by looking at the thickness of her skin and absence of hair on the majority of her body. But what makes Petunia stand out is this, her kidneys. You are looking at her right kidney. First notice how large it is, almost double the size of a normal kidney and where the medulla tissue should be, it is replaced with fluid. This condition is known as hydronephrosis. It is defined as this tension of the renal calyces and pelvis with urine as a result of obstruction to the outflow of urine distal to the renal pelvis. Anatomic abnormalities account for the majority of cases with neonates. Some abnormalities can include urethral stricture, ureteral stricture, or absence of either, either structure. I did not find the source of the hydronephrosis, however. Thank you for watching this video on doing necropsies on calves. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope you learned some interesting facts about the bovine anatomy. Now you know the basics of how to do your own necropsies. Stay curious.